Are you in the HubSpot ecosystem and looking to engage with the industry and manufacturing space? Are you in the industry and manufacturing space looking to learn more about how HubSpot can elevate your business? Join Chris and Salim, two HubSpot solution partners with 25 years in the industrial and manufacturing space, as they explore the intersection of these two worlds. Through interviews with experts from both ecosystems, they will attempt to bridge the gap in the largest market we know today. This podcast is an independent production by conveying your message and is not affiliated with or endorsed by HubSpot. The views, opinions, and positions expressed by the hosts and guests are theirs alone and do not reflect the views, opinions, or positions of HubSpot Incorporated. Any HubSpot employees appearing as guests on this podcast are not representing HubSpot in any official capacity and are sharing their own personal opinions. Welcome to Sprockets and Gears, the unofficial HubSpot industrial podcast. Welcome, everybody, to sprockets and gears an unofficial hubspot industrial podcast super special guest today uh george b thomas uh you know i was thinking about this earlier george uh the beauty of hubspot ecosystem and we're going to be talking about content a lot on this show uh, on and a lot of what we do is i think we've only known each other uh you know uh officially which means you've only known me for like a year, maybe. Yeah. I think a year. Yeah. But I've known you since 2017, you know, from the original Hubcast. You know, you've, you've been through many different uh, agencies, iterations of this HubSpot journey. So most people know you. The HubSpot, you know, great. Uh, and we thank you so much for, for being on the show. Is there anything you want to tell the people uh, and introduce yourself yeah so um first of all chris thanks uh for the the thing that i agree with the ecosystem it's amazing how quick you can start to know people without actually knowing people um because the power of content the power of brand um but i'll just let people know that you know i love to help humans with hubspot i've been doing it since 2012. i'm really excited about today's conversation that we're going to have because one of the things that we don't talk about enough um with our clients uh with each other and organizations is how dang important this human to human relationship is how important human to human communication is um, and how we all in organizations are kind of those, you know, firing synapses that have to work together to actually create something that can be magnificent if, if many times we just get out of our own way. That is a great way to start this episode. So let's just get into it. Let's do it. So George, um, you know, we're, we're new HubSpot partners. We've been doing this from the inside of these organizations. And, you know, recently I've had some thoughts about how can such a important business tool, right? We're going to talk about it as HubSpot, but it's really CRM, you know, as a platform has existed for 20, 30 years. And we still have companies that are still using Excel sheets and Outlook. So how could such an important business tool with proven ROI still not even be adopted by some companies 20, 30 years down the road? What, what are we doing wrong when it comes to trying to sell this to organizations, implement it, you know, the whole nine yards? Help us, help us out here. Yeah. So let's just start with a phrase you just used, Chris, which is proven ROI. Um, what I would say is proven to who? Right, the people who are using one and and using it properly, maybe the ROI is proven there. Uh, but for the people that are you're trying to get to adopt it, the people that aren't using it yet, um, nothing's been proven. And as a matter of fact, many companies that we've talked to that aren't using a CRM have tried to use a CRM previously and proven itself to actually be something that created dysfunction in the organization. And so let's go back to why did that happen and how do we actually prove ROI for these organizations? Many times when we put a CRM in place, 
first of all, we don't fully educate on what that means. I can tell you that there are a massive amount of people when you say CRM, they don't want to look stupid, so they don't say, what is that? But they don't even really understand what a CRM is, um, what it's supposed to do, uh, what goals that we should have around it. And they're like, oh yeah, sounds good. We're putting software in place so that uh, it'll be a silver bullet and the company will just run itself, which is no, that's not what we're gonna do. Historically too, if you think about what was happening with CRM adoption over the last 20 years, is when we did get a CRM in place, all of a sudden what we did is we did one of two things. We either tried to create the historical system that we had been using, spreadsheets, or another janky piece of software into the CRM that we now have. Because why would we change even though we just changed the entire platform that we have? Or the second thing is that it just became uber complex because some smart Einstein said we should customize this and customize that and we should integrate this app and we should add this on. And all of a sudden you had 27 layers of ish in the way of anybody being able to use the CRM in a streamlined way, right? So there's this level of complexity. There's this level of not engaging the I'm ready to change. Let's go ahead and move my cheese. Let's build something new. Let's build something better. Uh, this layer of not resting on what has been historically done. And, and all of these, by the way, are mindsets um, the, to get into best practices, to get into change, to get into true CRM adoption, we have to not just sell the platform, but we have to understand the people. And we have to be able to take the platform and understand the people to build the true process that people truly want to adopt and therefore get proven ROI on. And an easy breakdown right there. Uh, but this reminds me of a recent conversation I was having with an industrial sales guy. And for me, the most common thing I've heard when we're trying to sell the value of a CRM is it's going to save you time. And what this gentleman said to me is, you know, that's, that's bullshit. Like, uh, and just because you're saving me time, it doesn't mean sales productivity replaces that time, right? So when we try to sell this, so what is behind, can you break it down? What is behind him saying that, that we're full of shit when we say stuff like that? Why is that not resonating? Yeah, so first of all, the bigger problem, and I'll answer your question. The bigger problem is that the mindset of, and it's not being filled, the time saved, with sales activities or sales improvements. L listen, when I'm trying to get somebody to an, uh, adopt a CRM, I do say, hey, it's gonna save you a ton of time because it's going to streamline your process because no longer will you have to be doing data entry. No longer will you be playing the, hey, can you meet at this time volleyball game? No longer will you have to reverse engineer your show, your notes for every meeting that you're having. Like I give them specific things that are going to change and the way that they're going to save time and streamline. And the hook is I don't give two squats if you sell more with the time or not. As a matter of fact, I position it that hopefully they go get to golf more or they get to go spend more time with the ones that they love because it's when we can hook into what's important in somebody's life and knowing that they can achieve something with that more, that they're actually going to adopt and use a tool, adopt and use a process, uh, decide as a human to change. So some of our problems, by the way, when I hear you say that, is the fact that the lack of education to the top tier C-suite of what we should be expectant of the employees and what we should give as far as bonuses based on what they're doing. Because a bonus of allowing you to spend more time with your family doesn't cost me jack. Understanding that now in the six hours, you might sell 12 people where before in six hours, you could only sell four. I don't give a crap if you're out two hours earlier on the golf 
uh, course, doing whatever you want to do, right? And so not understanding as a C-suite, them getting the education that they need of the understanding of the tool, of the changes, of the mindset, of the process, to then have comfort to be like, oh, I'm, I'm cool with that. Then let's go ahead and move forward with this. And let's have one of the unpaid bonuses be that, oh, I don't know, humans get some of their life back? Yep. In fact, um, I, I really enjoy how you broke it down. Uh, we, just, we recently had this conversation, me and Chris, and I like to talk about it a lot. I've been a part of one successful digital transformation, albeit it wasn't on HubSpot, but I digress. Um, there's three elements of a digital transformation, and people always forget the third one, which you mentioned, is process, changing process. And in all of these industrial companies, there seems to be uh, the same thing all over again. ISO 9001 Quality Management System. It's a quality management system that was developed before these digital systems came to be. And every time I see an implementation happen, everybody focuses on the technology. Everybody then realizes that new technology creates friction and challenges. So there's change management, but everybody forgets the underlying process and they end up creating digital paper and people, instead of passing around a written note, uh, you know, over the cubicle wall, they're passing around a PDF in an email that gets stuck in an email or gets stuck in, in you know, one, one of the properties in the dig digital system. So uh, uh, I don't know if this is the first time I'm going to be coining this, but I'm trying to get digital paper, you know, <laughs> a thing. I'm, I'm sure you've yeah. seen a lot of digital paper in your day, George. Uh, I'm, so how I we, mean, just a few. <laughs> so how do we, right? And that could, it's, it seems like a simple thing, but like you said, the education and the time it takes to educate and the different formats people learn in these organizations are inherently it becomes hard to say i'm too busy selling i, I can't jump on a webinar or even a 15 minute call with you right now um so where does that like how do we get how do we wedge that in to even have meaningful conversations about what's working and what isn't and then how do we how do we progress? Yeah. So there's actually a lot in that question that you just asked, right? And what I mean by that is first of all, fundamentally, if the person says we're just too busy selling, it probably means that they're not selling enough already because they're trying to hit a number, they're not hitting the number, and if they stop, they feel like they're gonna fail, and they live in a culture where if they fail, they get fired. If they get fired, now they can't pay their house payment, and they can't put foot on the table. If you're in that type of culture or ecosystem, whoop, time to go, time to find, like life is too short, ladies and gentlemen. And so I would wanna uh, work for an organization that made that education mandatory. I would wanna work for an organization that had the leadership that they knew that if I can give them the education that empowers them to be a better human, a better seller, a better servant, a better whatever it is that my organization needs to be, they're going to, you know, hit their number, double their number, triple their number, not come from a place of scarcity, come from a place of abundance, um, have a positive attitude. Therefore, the culture starts to become a better culture just in, in a global sense because the humans are showing up differently. Now, to do that, you usually have to find what's important to them because here's the deal. We always make time for what's important to us. And let me give you a little clue. They don't give two squats about HubSpot. They don't give two squats about snippets, templates, documents, playbooks, lists, views, workflows. They don't care. So how do you tell the story? How do you um, inject the tools in a way that all of a sudden they do care and they care quickly and they care deeply? Because as soon as they care quickly and deeply, now time will be spent after work, on the weekends, whenever, like it's going to be there because they're like, oh my gosh, this is actually the hand up that I need to get to the place that I'm trying to go 
no matter where that is for them. And so how do you, as somebody who is selling HubSpot or selling services, be able to actually stop long enough to diagnose what is important to this human? Problem is we're not asking any of the questions that need to be asked around that because we're asking questions to provide a service. We're asking questions to sell a, a product. Um, we're not asking questions to the fact that we give a crap about the human. And that's where it all comes down to is that when you're willing to be a service provider that isn't scared to talk about the real deal holy field and real life and the pain points that are happening in their brain, their soul, and their wallet and are able to connect those pain points to why this tool, why this process, why this tech, why this change, it's very hard to get anywhere. But as soon as you become this holistic HubSpot helper, now all of a sudden things start to change. And that's a, a great segue because we, we hear this uh, message from HubSpot now, customer platform, right? And personally, what I've seen is that there's not a lot of knowledge around what a platform actually is, you know, more than more than what we're used to when there's a marketing hub, there's a sales hub, there's a service hub, they do these different things. And for me, it's exciting because I've, every time I've implemented HubSpot, it's been as many hubs as were available to me. And that is what these industrial and manufacturing organizations need, right? So a lot of what I think where we've gone awry, where the focus is always just like, how do we help the sales guy? How do they save time? At the end of the day, the sales guy usually thinks whatever they're doing right now is working. And in some cases it's been working for 40 years. So that's why I don't have time because I don't need help. Uh, but when you try to scale this stuff and you create this platform, the salesperson as they engage, they're helping somebody else do something. And oftentimes it's indirectly helping the sales guy because it, now we go from quoting, taking three weeks to one day, right? And now the customer gets taken care of so that they can order more later, faster. So take us through this, this platform mindset and maybe what you've seen and how we need to approach it this differently, because now we're going from enabling a sales professional and a marketing professional to really en enabling the whole squad, right? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to get to this customer platform thing, but I have to unpack a little bit of what you said because I think it's a, a, a good principle to understand. Many times you're going to enter into an organization and they're like, we need to make sales better. Sales needs to optimize a CRM. Uh, we need to do more sales training. We need to speed up the process of quoting. Like It's all about the sales rep, sales rep, sales rep, sales rep. And what's fun is actually, you know how you make a better sales rep? You make a better marketer. You know how you make a better sales rep? You, you make a better HR department. You make a better sales rep by making a better C-suite, right? You make a better service department by making a better sales department. And what, what that is, what I'm talking about is this RevOps mindset, this understanding of upstream and downstream effect, this idea of where there should be friction and where there should be force in an organization. And when you start to realize this, again, the word holistic in your organization, instead of these dang, mm, I want to swear, but I won't, these siloed departments that have been plaguing us for years and years and years. Yes, there are reasons why they should be separate, but separate is different si than siloed. And so this idea of how can they actually work and combine and be together now, when we grab that mindset and we start to realize making better humans is by making other humans better, you can put that on X, Instagram or Facebook if you want to. Now we can start to think about this customer platform. And here's the funny thing. I love, Chris, that you mentioned there's not a whole lot of education around this thing that is a customer platform. We have to remember uh, a very important piece of HubSpot, and that is HubSpot started out as marketers. And if you think, what is a marketer's uh, favorite answer to any question? It depends. It depends. That's right, <laughs> Salim. It depends. 
And so when we take a customer platform or we name something a customer platform, the true answer for everybody is, well, what is it? Can you educate it on us? It depends. What are you trying to do with it? What do your people need? And I mean internal people. What do your people need? I mean external customers, leads. What is what is the process? What is you know what does it need to become? And this is where I talk about and train on the idea of wrapping HubSpot around your business. Because the true answer is it depends. It depends on what products and services you provide. It talks, it depends on the personas that you're actually, uh, by the way, personas, humans, that you're providing it to. It depends on the questions that you need to ask, the answers that you want to get, and everything down the line. It depends. So, when I think about customer platform, what I would just beg people to think about is it is a big ball of Play-Doh that we can turn into whatever it needs to be, which means it's also this amazing scalable thing over time. Because you see, a customer platform could be HubSpot free across the board. A customer platform could be HubSpot starter across the board. A customer platform could be HubSpot enterprise across the board. And you're fundamentally going to be able to do way different things based on the level of HubSpot you have. And I would even say that dependent upon what you need to create is going to provide what level of platform you need to have. Because not everybody needs to have the CMS. Not everybody needs to have private content. Not everybody needs, well, yes, everybody actually does probably need to have forecasting and prospecting. But you get my point. Like, you can pick from the bag of tricks that you want to provide or create the customer platform that you need. So it gets very difficult. Now, here's where I get excited for you and other partners like if we have a set of people that we help all the time, for instance, can I start to create a customer platform around accounting firms? You know it. Why? I help multiple accounting firms. Can I help create a customer platform around insurance agencies? You know it. Helping multiple insurance agencies, right? So if you're in a, a niche per se, manufacturing, Let's be honest. The problems are the problems and they'll always be the problems. And what's funny is nobody's dang different. And so now we can start to wrap our mind around. We see these dysfunctional patterns. How do we build a process and customize a platform where these dysfunctional items go away? And now we've created the elite customer platform for manufacturing using these different layers of HubSpot team break let's go vacation to like i don't know bimini because we just freaking crushed the yearly revenue goal that we had to hit because we're so awesome i i i love how you put it george and you say uh, wrapping uh, the customer platform around the business and i guess uh us being from industrial and manufacturing and helping uh, those niches there's the 800 pound software gorilla in the room which is the business in manufacturing and industrial is the ERP. Yeah. And ERPs have not been, you know, the the best user friendly or fit to purpose or like nobody has had an amazing experience using an ERP, everybody yeah. using it br begrudgingly only because uh, that's that's all they've known. That Do doesn't last any? very long, by the way. That doesn't last. Like, I don't drive uh, to Blockbuster anymore because I can just Netflix or Hulu it, right? Um, at some point, HubSpot or something else or an app that is created is going to be the magic wand that people go, boom, I don't need to live in that funky world anymore. And all of a sudden, the world of ERPs will start to dis disintegrate because the pain – and the acceptance of the pain, once they see the orange Ferrari, will no longer make sense. And they'll be like, how can I just bolt on like an orange mini kind of trailer, new ERP system, to my orange Lamborghini, HubSpot, and really start to skirt, skirt down the road. That's where the mind eventually will get because you only put up with that pain for so long or until a, an, an other option is just so easy and makes so much sense. And by the way, 
if you start to think about what HubSpot is doing with now the e-commerce hub, with now the uh, new uh, uh, same object associations, with all of the pieces that they're starting to add in, I would beg somebody to look at what an ERP can do and what the small gaps that HubSpot might have from what it can do to what HubSpot can do and actually sit down and think, is there a way that right now we could add one or two apps or one, one other small integration and provide almost 90%, if not soon, 100% of what the ERP is doing in HubSpot just by having a different mindset and being willing to build a slightly different process, and dare I say maybe a more modernized process for the modern buyer to <laughs> actually be able to be supported than what they've done since, the, since their uncle, brother's grandpa started the company. I always love when I do it good enough that Chris just gets quiet. <laughs> you you talking about the modern buyer is hitting exactly uh, at the problem. A lot of these industrial and manufacturing companies started 50 years ago with an innovative product that nobody has seen. And they corner a market to a degree that if you need that product, you have to put up with whatever customer experience you're getting. And until somebody else comes in and gives gives you a better customer experience, nobody's going to feel like, oh, uh, our, our non-modern customer experience is the reason why we're not growing or we're struggling to grow or because uh, or it's the reason that our customer facing teams are getting crushed or like all of that until somebody comes in and, and shows them how it's done. Uh, Everybody is comfortable having their customers settle. Th that's and the problem. That's yeah. the and problem. They, they like, disregard the fact that we are humans and B2B companies are also humans and humans shop on Amazon and order pizza from Domino and, you know, watch Netflix. We all have these, you know, consumer customer platforms that give us everything we need uh, right there on our phone without picking up the phone or talking to anybody. But we come to, to you know, our B2B job and say, yeah, we need them to call us and schedule a meeting so they can know what the status of their orders are. Yeah, you hit on a big problem, right? The problem is comfort. Um, we got in early 50 years ago. We uh, have a very innovative product that people still haven't thought was important to come and try to beat us at. So we've got the entire market. And so we get comfortable. Hey, we make seven million a year, man. That's dope. Like, let's just keep chugging along, keep people hitting their numbers. I can just chill and relax. In those scenarios, I would beg people to be their own competitor and to fight against their own comfort. And the reason I would ask them to do that is because they have to realize that it's really for them zero about their competitor and 100% about their customer. And if you're going to show up for work, own a business or be part of an organization and not show up to be your best self, to provide the best thing for the humans that have a hurdle that your innovative product is fixing, knowing that you're then getting to an aspirational point that they didn't even believe was possible before they found your widget. And you're not pushing it to realize, shoot, I'm comfortable with seven, but if we just did this thing, it could be 70. And then understanding the impact that they could make to their employees, the community and the world with 10x the amount that they were comfortable with. And now instead of I got this innovative product, they're focused on how do I have an innovative process? How do I have innovative people like that's what I would ask them to turn their eyes on and start to build as they move forward. So why don't they take that step? George, like, because I'd argue that that space to be comfortable with what's been is vanishing every day. Because what we've seen is either somebody figures out that competitive differentiation of customer experience and they crush you, or business is booming because you are the only game in town and the growth is crushing you, it's crushing your internal people. 
people don't care about the customer experience because they have to buy from you. It's a commodity, whatever. But at some point, the system breaks because you can't wrap your mind around the growth potential, the growth that's happening to you. And those are the times where I get and like the last thing they need is leads and, and pipeline and they need process, they need systems. And so when in these two scenarios, yeah, like what, what have you found to work to get them to take that step? Like to just, cause it does take, and this is the leadership transformation that, you know, is kind of the third piece. If you think about cultural and process and digital transformation leadership, like, you know, not only the CEO, but each leader in each department needs to take this growth mindset to say, Hey, this is why we need to put in scalable systems. This is why we can't rely on, you know, our, our, uh, experienced, uh, ready to retire expert, uh, for all of the sales support, right? So it seems like there's very obvious pieces and reasons to take this approach, but that, that growth mindset, like what have you seen work to get people to kind of look at it from that perspective or just take that step to even decide to, to look into it at least? Yeah. So I've got an idea that I want to throw out there, but then I have to unpack just kind of who I am and why I think it fundamentally works for what I do and the people that I talk to. And, and I'll need you to do me a favor. Um, I'll need you to pay attention to the rest of the episodes that you create and, and find somebody that talks as bluntly as I do about real world shit. Like, I don't think you're going to find somebody that it, there's there's a few of us out there, but like, I don't care if you're the leader. If I'm talking to you and you're the leader and your junk is a mess, I'm going to let you know your junk is a mess. And too many times they sit in their organization in their ivory tower and they've hired about a bazillion yes men and yes women. And instead of them feeling discomfort in their wallet or their bank account, sales is getting laid off. Marketing is getting laid off. Like everything else is exploding, becoming toxic and corrosive. Yet they're still on their boat somewhere or in their RV somewhere or coming in with a big, you know, whatever into the office and zero clues because nobody's actually there saying, yo, stuff is falling apart. Everybody wants the boss to be happy because as soon as you get in the boss's direction, not happy, you're afraid of getting fired. Like psychologically, Many organizations are not built, especially old school. If you started 50 years ago, you didn't hire somebody just to come in in the morning and smack you across the back of the head and tell you the seven things that are wrong with your business. But I would beg people to have a human that their position is to look at all the things that are wrong and tell me as the owner, how can I fix my ish today? Which leads me to my idea. I love the show Undercover Boss because stuff changes, hearts are moved, people are blessed, and the amount of business owners that I wish would come out of their ivory tower and walk the floor, walk the line, um, be part of the production process, um, sit with somebody who's actually shipping a product, and again, they, do they have to put a mustache on and a freaking wig? And no, no, it doesn't have to be the damn show. But if, if you know, my dad ha told me this when I was younger, he said, never judge a man till you walk a mile in their moccasins. Meaning, how is that C suite, how is that leader supposed to have empathy or understanding for anything that's happening if they're not spending time in those segments of the business? They're looking at a PL. They're looking at a spreadsheet. They're waiting for somebody to just build them a dang HubSpot dashboard with some reports that tell them everything's okay. Everything's okay. Keep chugging. That's not the reports I really want to build. I want to have both sides of the story when I'm building reports. Here's where it's great. Here's where we can fix it. And so that's the thing. Like you almost have to want to push yourself uh, as a leader to push your organization 
Um, but and I don't mean push your organization as like, come on, everybody, we got to do this. I mean, everybody wants to do it. Everybody wants to row the boat. Everybody likes the thing that they're in because, again, it comes down to culture. We are paying attention to the individual humans. We're helping them be educated on the best process, and we're tweaking the process over time. And we just happen to be using a platform or a set of platforms to make it all work in this digital world we live in. George, you know what's infuriating? That a lot of these leaders, they are technical experts. They're either engineers or you know scientists that uh, you know started this whole thing or uh, inherited from their their parents, but. They actually do that in matters of manufacturing and operation. They go in deep. They they revolutionize their process. They they sit in the engineer's shoes, and they they optimize and clean up process. But when it comes to RevOps and customer experience, all of a sudden, no, that doesn't matter, and like they stop there. I've mm. witnessed it. I witnessed it. Some amazing overhauls on the operations side but never on the RevOps and customer experience. Well, let's be honest with that. It's not because it's not important. It's because it scares the crap out of them. It's because they don't know anything about it. See, they go and revolutionize and tinker and innovate in the place that they're comfortable. And then they just let the rest be the rest. I'll tell you, uh, honestly, a diddle, dirty little secret about me. I'm a creative I love being creative. I love creating content. I love telling stories. I like designing websites. Um, do I love owning a business? Absolutely. Been one of the best decisions that I have ever made in my life. Have I honestly been wondering how in the world I could get somebody to run my business that actually loves to run a business, like the operations, the HR, like all the things that I honestly go, whoo, that scares the crap out of me, but there's nobody else here, so I better at least figure it out enough just to get by, which most people won't push themselves into this those discomfort areas. I definitely push myself in there. But I, I aggressively am trying to figure out how do I hire somebody that's better than me that loves to run a business but doesn't want to own a business um, because I know that the, understanding our strengths and our weaknesses and being able to ignore this dumbass uh, idea of always be fixing your weaknesses, double down on your strengths, hire somebody for your weaknesses, and move the frick forward. And, and we're not doing that in many organizations. We're not. We're just either ignoring it because we're scared of it. Um, we don't understand the, the impact of hiring somebody, what it would make, um, because we we just stick in our little box with our blinders on and go, yeah, but I innovated the product today. Yeah, well, Bobby just lost his job, bro. Yeah, but I innovated the product today. Yeah, but we got no marketing team. They quit. Yeah, but I innovated the product today. What kind of freaking cycle is that? I think it's the traditional cycle, unfortunately. And this is where it's like, <laughs> there are some that probably have fear and that's not, they're not moving, but I think there's some that just don't know, like that it's, this is even a thing that they should be worried about. Right. And I've watched, which is, you know, why I'm excited to, uh, you know, have this this growth agency and try to start helping as many people as we can. Cause I I've met HubSpot in 2017. Uh, and since then I've just been like, you know, reading, listening to as much as I can podcasts, audiobooks, just always learning. Right. And I've watched this space of, you know, whether it be, uh, SEO firms, let's call them. Um, or even as far as the HubSpot ecosystem, right? And this is where the education required to get the knowledge where it needs to be is not even available to these people in that we don't know how to talk to them. We don't know how to speak their language. We don't understand, you know, what they're actually going through on a daily basis. And when we do, we use kid gloves. Like, 
and that's one thing we're we're gonna do our best not to do because as an example when we first started coming in understand our positioning who like how do we tell everybody who we help you look at other places in this ecosystem you know hubspot and not whenever somebody works with a manufacturing says they're focused on manufacturing almost all the case studies 100 percent lead generation like that's it guess what's not working anymore like guess what you don't need when you're setting records every month revenue wise you need like the RevOps education, which has been missing, and it requires some challenging conversations because you, most of these companies are not even structured in a way that they can effectively support a RevOps mindset. And that's where it's like, like you mentioned, HR makes a better salesperson leadership. All these teams need to find a way to come together. And so how do we, you know, aside from, you know, kind of taking the kid gloves off, like what are some other ways that we can communicate, you know, more effectively that leads to them? Because at, at, at the end of the day, they need to own this. Like we from the outside cannot own this for them, but we got to find a way to trigger these conversations and this insight from them so they can see that it could be as simple as applying all of the things they know about lean manufacturing apply that to your customer process. That's it. But yeah. it's such a far jump for them. And that's where, you know, these organizations haven't had a marketing department ever. And now they're bringing one in because COVID or a digital experience or whatever, some other thing tells them they have to. And this department's like 50 years behind the rest of the organization, but it's all of a sudden supposed to start working like clockwork. How, how do we yeah. educate on that? Well, it's funny because the answer is kind of in your question, right? Because your question was uh, you used the word communicate and you used the word conversations. And when I would first step into an organization like you guys are helping, the first thing I would start to ask questions was like, when's the last time this department talked to this department? Um, do you have monthly meetings? Do you have weekly meetings? Like, show me, uh, do you guys have Slack teams? Like, how are you commuting, day, commu not commuting, communicating day in and day out, right? Are you digital? Are you all in office? Like, I want to understand their historical communication efforts or lack thereof. Then for me, I want to figure out how can I start more uh, inter-department conversations? How do I get them to speak to each other more on a daily basis, weekly basis, monthly basis? How do I become kind of the the you know Alexander Graham Bell, if you will, to the organization. Here's the other piece, though, that I want to lean into is many times uh, HubSpot partners, service providers, um, we feel like it's our job to come in and tell, tell, this is what's broke. This is what you should do. Uh, I would I would beg service providers to lean more into understanding the power of the question the power of asking and the power of listening. And in the speaker realm, what we have this thing that we always talk about where you want your audience to feel like they discovered America. It's the Columbus principle, even though we could talk about if it really was Columbus that discovered America <laughs> and all that, but it's called the Columbus principle. And we want them to feel like they discovered their America. When you lean into the um, power of questions, and they're the ones giving the answers and you're listening and you're guiding and you're helping to navigate the ship. And all of a sudden they as a team go, ooh, ah, that's a great idea. And it was your idea all along, but you let it be theirs. Now some things have happened. It's their idea. You've had them communicating. You've done less telling. You've done more asking. And now that they're like, ah, I've got this idea. Hey, guess what? Here's how we can achieve that idea. And you have the steps. You have the strategy. And you come in as the hero because now they actually know where in God's name they are. And they kind of see where they want to get to. And you can get them there. Right? So, again, the power of question 
the power of enabling them to come up with a good idea, and this idea of being the Alexander Graham Bell of internal communication for organizations. What microsystems do we need to set up so these humans actually get out of their earbuds, get out of their Facebook or TikTok stream, get out of going to lunch by themselves because they effing hate everybody in the organization, nobody understands me, to this place where, man, I love these humans. I would do anything for these humans. Oh, you want me to do that? Absolutely, I can do that. Actually, that's in my skill set. I've been waiting for somebody to ask me to do that. Culture. Right. Like I've said that what third or fourth time, the culture that you're building for these humans, for these people to enable this process to be able to use this product. Like it's not like any of this is disconnected. Hopefully everybody realizes I keep coming back to the same freaking points. It's just having the mindset, the vision, the understanding to be able to see the big picture and understand the pieces that you have to move around on the board. So, so where do you start? I mean, sometimes, cause definitely internally, this has been the missing piece. Like I'm being brought in to build a marketing department that did not exist and do some things that have never been done before. And there's no effective internal communication mechanisms in place. What I just described is impossible. I, I cannot accomplish that goal without these systems. And so it's easy to identify, like this is the part that's breaking down. You used to be able to knock on the office door. Now you gotta try and do this from home, right? Now everybody's email inbox is exploding. We don't have a messaging tool, which, how are we communicating in which channel uh, is definitely a huge piece of the puzzle, but how do we get the, like, what is it that we can do to help them take the first step towards understanding that something so foundational that they've relied on subconsciously for years because they haven't ever had to deal with it. They haven't had to educate their teams in this way. They haven't had to worry about the customer experience in this way. Everything's been working and now it's not. Yeah. Where, where do I start? So I think I can give you a couple easy ones and I can give you maybe what is the most difficult one um, or difficult one of ones of, of many. Because um, by the way, <laughs> this whole conversation we're having is predicated on the fact that we're dealing with humans and humans are just messy. Humans are difficult. We just are, okay? So first of all, where can I start? Obviously a discovery meeting, right? The problem is usually when we do these discovery meetings, it's like I need to talk to you know two salespeople, and if, especially if there's not a marketing team, like then it's two salespeople and this the CEO or whoever we get, and we're like just asking questions. Uh, so what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? How many visitors? How many leads? Like uh, what is it? Is that the right color? Purple should be different color. Purple. Like it's all these like questions, but we should have a discovery session. The thing that I would say do different is in the first discovery session, ask for one or two people out of each department and give people the room to actually talk. And that first discovery session, I would almost beg you not to have C-suite in it because as soon as C-suite enters the door, everybody's going to shut up. But we can have another C-suite discovery session separate from the normal air quotes there, human beings, normal human beings that are actually doing like the day to day tasks. I want yes. to find the I gap. To, I, I want to find to the gap. Go highlight ahead. each department. Yes. Right. Yes. This HubSpot conversation, this CRM conversation, this website conversation, this customer experience conversation impacts every single department, even accounting who is sending and receiving invoices to the customers. Yep. Right. So this is where you go wrong. You don't involve all the people impacted right away. Yep. It's really hard to get them bought in. Yep. So get get the uh, departments again, that discovery session. Have a C-suite that's different. The reason I'm having a C-suite discovery and a normal human being's discovery is now I want to see how far apart the gap is. 
Now if I can diagnose the gap, how far it is, I know how much work I actually have to do. So it's the discovery session, um, and, it's, and it's, again, looking for the messy. Like you mentioned, everybody's email's exploding. We're doing it in a digital world. They don't have a team to Slack. Like, okay, so the next part that I'm going to get started with is I'm going to, during that discovery session, one of the things we're going to talk about is communication because I quickly need to figure out how can I fix communication. So discovering and understanding and enabling communication, two great starting points. Easy. Those are easy compared to what is about to come out of my mouth. And if you're watching this, listening to this, and you get offended, first of all, I apologize. Second of all, check yourself. Because here's the big understanding that we need to get people to understand. Ignorance and incompetence is not a business strategy. I must say that again for the people in the back seats. Ouch. Ignorance and incompetence is not a business strategy, right? If you're incompetent, uh, you're not capable of knowing or willing to apply, uh, you know, uh, what um, is going to happen. So you shouldn't be doing the job. Get somebody else to do the freaking job if you're incompetent and you can't figure it out, right? Ignorance, um, you don't know any better. Well, then you need to figure out how you're going to educate yourself, a.k.a. HubSpot Academy, uh, Lin learning, uh, LinkedIn Learning used to be lynda.com. I still call it that just because I'm a creature of, of habit, right? Um, the industry blogs or, or whatever, like, uh, you know, your HubSpot partner that you're getting all this great juicy content from. Like, if, if you feel like you're in a place of ignorance, learn. If you're in a place of incompetence, then get the hell out of the way. But just know... That you are stifling your business and you can't have this mindset of it'll be okay. It's not a business strategy. That one's more difficult, by the way, Chris. It's really hard to have that conversation with humans. It is. It'll be okay. Not a good strategy. That is for sure. Um, well, we could go for a while and we definitely loved having you on today. I definitely hope you can stop by every now and then you know our goal with this is to really educate on hubspot and in the case of industrial manufacturing really get to the root causes of why where the challenges are for implementing these systems that can help so many people because they really can and we're going to do our best to educate we know you're working hard over there um I want to wrap up with, with some rapid fire questions. Uh oh, okay. Uh, just a few. Um, most overrated HubSpot tool. Oh, most overrated HubSpot tool. Oh, man, that's actually, I don't know if I've ever been asked that question, to be honest with you. Um, mm, mm, mm. I'm usually, a, I, I usually fight for the underdog. So I that's know. interesting. Um, well, so underrated historically on the come up now. That's what I'll say. Uh, the legacy CTA tool, uh, underrated. People didn't understand how you should use it, used it wrong. It slowed down uh, site speed or they only created dumb buttons instead of like doing image-based CTAs. And so... Um, you know, it was, it originally popped up to be this like amazing thing, but then usage and lack of innovation, it just was, ah, it's kind of overrated. I say that in that now there's a new CTA tool and the things that you can start to do with this one, um, well, they get me excited. Let's just put it that way. That's a good call out. Um, most misunderstood. HubSpot tool. Oh yeah. Workflows by any chance. Like, um, when we, when we're training people on workflows, they're like, you know, that email automation thing. And I'm like, Oh God, yes, we can do that thing with it. Um, but it can do so much more. Um, and there's so many like pieces in there that are misunderstood inside the tool itself. Like, the fact that you can find a seasoned HubSpot, uh, you know, air quotes expert using it for two, three, four years and ask them if they're applying workflow goals 
uh, to their workflows and why that's important. Or you'll have somebody that'll ask you, well, like, can I get workflow? Like, can I do auto unenrollment in workflows? And then fundamentally, you know that they don't know what one of the jobs of workflow goals is. So like, there's just a bunch of like misunderstood pieces of it and the tool in itself is very much misunderstood in what it can be and should be used for. That is an agreeable answer, I think. I'm glad. I didn't know this was a test. I know. Uh, well, we're going to see uh, how many people we align on this because that's what we're seeing. Like, you know, uh, once somebody's in the tool, uh, it's pretty hard not to love it. Yep. But people from the outside think it's a whole range of different things. Oh, yeah. And oftentimes it's based on Ooh, dang education God. from three or four years ago. And HubSpot moves so fast. It's like, no, no, that's not. They fix that. Right. My, I should I should have given you a different answer. My answer, I won't go into why, um, but my answer should have been data sets, actually. That's the most misunderstood piece of HubSpot right now. I get people think it's seven different things and it's none of those seven things when I talk to them. Anyway, moving on, I guess. Fair enough. All right. Well, uh, we thank you so much for being on this, uh, this episode of sprockets and gears. Uh, really excited to be a part of this ecosystem, learning from the greats like yourself. Uh, I'm so happy that you could stop by and, and share the love with us. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Uh, anytime I'm headed to my favorite spot, you guys are right next to my favorite bagel shop. So I'll grab a bagel, come in for another episode in the future. Sounds amazing. Where can, uh, until that time, in the meantime, where can, where can people find you? Yeah, it's easy. Just head over to georgebthomas.com. Uh, there's all sorts of pages there you can read, look at. Um, obviously, I'm on the socials. You can hit LinkedIn, George B. Thomas. Uh, honestly, however you like to communicate, just hit us up. Reach out if you've got questions. We'd love to help. Awesome. Thanks so much. Until next time. Thanks, gents.